Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. On this week's Wealth Track podcast, influential economist, savvy Fed watcher, and now professor Paul McCulley on Fed policy, recession prospects, and the markets. I think if we go into a recession, and a recession that is plain to see for everybody, then there's no question that the Fed would ease monetary policy in the coming year. But in the absence of a clear and evident, I think Wall Street is too optimistic on a reversal of monetary policy to the easing side. This week on Wealth Track. Hello and welcome to this Wealth Track podcast. I'm Consuelo Mack. Our topic today is Fed policy, recession prospects, and the markets. And our guest is Paul McCulley, an adjunct professor at Georgetown Business School and a very much in demand speaker because of his deep understanding of Fed policy, honed at bond giant PIMCO, where for many years he was senior partner, author of the influential Global Central Bank Focus, and manager of its huge short term trading desk. Paul, welcome to Wealth Track. Thank you. I'm going to cut right to the chase. At this juncture, August of 2022, since March, we are four rate hikes in, two and a quarter full percentage points. That is 225 basis points in Wall Street lingo. The last two were big ones, 75 basis points each. The Fed funds rate is around 225 to 250. Where are we in the Fed's tightening cycle? I think we're well advanced in the tightening cycle. I don't think it's over. I think we probably have at least another 100 basis points over the next 6 to 12 months. But to date, I think the Fed has lived up to its word of wanting to front load this normalization process. I think they've done a really nice job of doing it. And I think they're now in the mode of measured probing into restrictive territory. They've gotten by their own reckoning to neutral. They got there very expeditiously with the last four FOMC meetings. And now I think they will continue tightening, but in a more measured fashion and will be very responsive to incoming data that gives us a sense of how much traction the tighter monetary policy is. So I think the last 75 basis points of hike actually was fist on table about getting to neutral. Now they'll be probing into restrictive. Okay. What is neutral? What, what does that mean for the lay people out here, including myself? Neutral is a very, very hotly debated concept in my profession. Uh, and we could talk for hours about it, which we won't, but essentially neutral is the place they would be if the economy was in perfect equilibrium. Obviously it isn't. So it's a theoretical concept. If you're in perfect equilibrium, which would mean that you're at full employment or maximum employment. So you're in equilibrium on the labor market. And you're simultaneously in equilibrium on their inflation target, which is 2%. We're really not now, Paul, right? With inflation as high as it is and unemployment is really low. So what's the the next step to get to the Fed's goal of 2% inflation? It's a really good question because it's self-evident we're not at neutral in real time because the economy is not in equilibrium, which is why I think there's so much debate about it and the use of the word neutral by Fed Chair uh, Powell, uh, because we're obviously not in equilibrium on either front. So them declaring that they've gotten to quote unquote neutral is not saying where Uh, they need to be right now or where they're going, what it is telling us uh, is that they have removed the accommodation that came about as a result of all the shocks we've had, most notably, obviously, the pandemic over the last couple of years. So at the end of the day, you could say that declaring neutral uh, against this theoretical concept is saying they are no longer, quote, 
behind the curve. Yes, they have more work to do because they need to be into restrictive territory, but they're not behind the theoretical neutral curve. That, okay. That's a nuance that's really difficult to explain to the average American. I fully understand that. But from a academic or warm perspective, it does make sense in that they've gotten back to a level that would be, quote unquote, appropriate if we were in equilibrium. You did say something that I understand is that the Fed is no longer behind the curve. I mean, that's another very technical term, but basically the Fed has gotten a lot of flack uh, for not taking the punch bowl away sooner, for not going to a more restrictive monetary policy sooner. What is your take on the Fed's uh, continuing its easing policy until basically this year? I think the Fed was behind the curve. And I think they were behind the curve by approximately six months in 2021. They didn't rhetorically pivot until November of 21, when effectively they elevated fighting inflation to their uh, number one priority. They started the taper of the bond buying in November of 21, and then they accelerated it in December of 21. And then they completed it in early March of this year. And within a matter of days, they did their first rate hike off of zero by 25 basis points. And then obviously they had three more meetings after that, where they went 50 once and 75 twice. So essentially they did their pivot last November and arguably they should have done that pivot six months earlier in the spring of 21, when two big things happened. Number one is the vaccine rollout really took off in the spring. So we effectively were accelerating the reopening of the economy in the spring with the wonder of the vaccine. And the other factor was that the new Biden administration with a unified government passed a very robust fiscal stimulus package in the spring of 21. And that would be a reasonable time to mark when they should have started pulling back on their extraordinary pandemic era monetary policy. If I were grading them, I would say, you know, you were six months late. At the same time, I would give them a very high mark that once they pivoted, even if it was six months late, they pivoted with dispatch and vigor. And ever since November of, of 21, they have demonstrated a great deal of hawkish resolve. So when I look back at it, yeah, we can, we can criticize them for being six months late, but where I come from is let's praise them for an exquisite performance over the two, two and a half years, the response to the pandemic, the cooperation with an all of government approach and their focus on trying to limit the damage to the real economy by putting down a marker that, that during 20 and 21, getting back to full employment was the top priority and they were willing to underwrite some increase in inflation. And it turned out to be higher than they thought, but that's with 2020 hindsight. Paul, what damage has been done by the Fed not tightening sooner? I mean, how much worse is inflation because of that policy, do you think? I don't think that it is materially worse. I don't think six months delay is nefarious. I think it's true that inflation is probably higher than otherwise would have been the case. And I think that probably uh, would be concentrated in the housing sector because them being six months late, if you will, allowed a last bubble ass move in the property market, which really damaged affordability and then spilled over into the rent market. You could also argue that maybe that that six month delay made the labor market 
hotter. And I think that is a credible argument and therefore made labor shortages more nasty and therefore led to somewhat higher wages, which going forward would be, will be kind of hard to, to temper. And actually going forward, the biggest area I worry about from the standpoint of inflation is actually on the housing side, which is not just a Federal Reserve issue at all. It also reflects the fact that over the last 10 to 15 years, this country has systematically underinvested in the housing stock. So we literally have a physical shortage of affordable housing, and I wouldn't put that all at the Fed's feet at all. Is that something that the Fed needs to respond to, however? Is it responding to that as well in its consideration of all of the reasons that it is so aggressively tightening? I think the Fed does need to respond to it as part of the mosaic of things that it's responding to. And I think it has cracked the speculative fever in the, the property market, which I think is a good thing. One of the most compelling reasons for them to, you know, continue a pace into restrictive territory is to lean on the housing market because while prices have stopped going up, they are still at bubble levels. So I think there are excesses in the property market that need to come out. And while that is not the Fed's billboard objective right now, it's certainly one of their objectives. We are speaking with influential Fed watcher and economist Paul McCulley. Paul, one of the areas that you give the Fed high marks is the froth that it's taken out of the markets. Do you want to address that? Is that job done? In many respects, it will depend upon what, what the market itself does. In the first half of this year, they did a really good job of taking the froth out of the marketplace. But obviously, over the last month to six weeks, the marketplace has been ebullienting the notion that the Fed is about to uh, finish the tightening campaign and that it's time to get back into the pool, if you will, of chasing uh, speculative-oriented investments. And you can see that in the nature of what's been outperforming over the last six weeks. It has been the most beaten down in the first half of the year. And so one of the concerns I have here, and I think the Fed does as well, is that Wall Street may go back to having a party before essentially the normalization process into restricted is complete. Right. Some expectations on Wall Street are that the Fed is going to ease next year. How realistic is that, do you think? I think if we go into a recession, and a recession that is plain to see for everybody, then there's no question that the Fed would ease monetary policy in the coming year. But in the absence of a clear and evident, I think Wall Street is too optimistic on a reversal of monetary policy to the easing side. My ba base case scenario is that they will find an area in the restrictive zone that they're comfortable with. And that will be because they're getting signals from the economy that the froth has come off, including on the labor market. And then I think they will want to maintain that peak level for the policy rate for an extended period of time in order to bear down, if you will, on the fundamental inflationary forces, in particular from the labor market and the property market. And that's really where the big debate is on Wall Street right now is where's the peak going to be? And then is the peak going to be a point or a plateau? And I think there's a general consensus that the peak is going to be, you know, in and around the three and a half area and the marketplace is more or less priced to that. And ironically enough, if they want to maintain the peak as a plateau, not a point, that would argue for them to turn down the dial on the size of the increases going forward, that we don't need shock and awe anymore. In contrast, if they are tightening as if their hair were on fire, then 
uh, Wall Street can logically assume, well, if they do this, they're going to break something and then they're going to have to uh, reverse it with easing. So how restrictive do you think the Fed should get? And I'm, I'm thinking of two things. Number one, you said, you know, maybe three and a half percent in the Fed funds rate. So that's a, you know, a little bit more than a percentage point, full percentage point from here. Then they've got this inflation target of 2%, which is way below what inflation is running now. So how do you square those two? Inflation is very much a lagging indicator. And so they don't have to keep tightening until they get back to a 2% inflation rate. In fact, I think that would be very much a policy mistake. They need to, to, to know that they have weakened the economy sufficiently to put in train a period of disinflation or a declining rate of inflation. They don't actually have to get to 2% before they can declare that their mission is complete. In fact, if they were to say, we're going to have to keep tightening until we get to 2%. That would be a policy error and virtually a guarantee of a recession. What Fed Chair Powell and most of his colleagues say, what we need to have is compelling evidence, compelling and convincing evidence that we're headed towards 2%, not that we're achieving 2%. What do you think it's going to take to get there to see this compelling and convincing evidence? The data we have right now is a long way from compelling and convincing <laughs> evidence. At the same time, it is better than a poke in the eye. We actually did get the benefit of the rollover in commodity prices, though you wouldn't necessarily uh, pound the table about that on the food side of things. So. We're seeing a turn, if you will, in the inflation fever, which in many respects wasn't just, you know, a function of easy fiscal and monetary policy, but we also had a war in Ukraine. What we're seeing right now is good, but it is a long way from compelling and convincing evidence that inflation has really been knocked on its backside, that would be a stretch, regardless of how much Wall Street wants to celebrate inflation on its backside. What, what's your advice to investors who are looking at their, you know, 401k portfolios and their concern because they've, you know, suffered some, you know, fairly sizable declines? I think for the, for the broad market, which we're talking about the S&P, this has actually been, in many respects, a pretty gentle landing. Mm -hmm. It really has. You look at where the level of the S&P is now versus prior to the pandemic versus prior to a year ago, and there hasn't been a huge amount of damage. Effectively, we've taken off that foam that was the result of the Fed being six months late in many respects. That last six months of the bull was simply running on air and hopes and dreams and animal spirits. So we've taken that out. But from the standpoint of severe damage to people's long-term investment portfolios and their asset allocation, there hasn't been a wicked sort of experience so far. Now, that's not true in your speculative elements. And so if, if investors were involved in the speculative elements of the market, not your broad S&P, but your uh, no profits on the foreseeable horizon, they were involved in that area, then they've been beat around the head and shoulders pretty hard. And I don't have a huge amount of tears for that. One of the, the features of this period that I think has been a bit of a shock to a lot of investors is goes back to the old notion of the 60-40 portfolio and the think in terms of, you know, the economy gets a little weak, the equity market gets smacked around the head and shoulders, then my bonds will be good because they'll go up in price. And in the first half of this year, it did not work the way, you know, the textbook says because you had a bear market in both stocks and bonds. So, so I think the biggest issue that financial advisors are probably grappling with these days is the asset allocation question, because 
during the first half of this year, you did not have bonds as a diversifier of stocks and, and both were pummeled. And I think that reflects the unique circumstances that led to what the Fed had to do starting last November. But now that the Fed is back to neutral, and I stress that's a theoretical concept, not a real world concept, then the core tenets underlying a 60-40 portfolio still makes sense to me as you know, evidenced by the fact that I said, if this economy does go into a nasty recession, which is not my base case at all, but it did do that, the equity market would be smacked a bit, but there's zero question that the Fed would reverse to an easing pattern and it would be bullish for bonds. One wrinkle to that concept, however, is that people say, you know, 60 stocks, 40 bonds and bonds being, being interpreted as the broad bond market, effectively the S&P 500 equivalent of the bond market, which is known as the, uh, the Bloomberg Aggregate Index. And I would say that going forward, financial advisors should think in terms of what duration or maturity should they have on the bond portion of their diversified portfolio, given the fact I think structurally inflation is going to be biased to be higher this decade than it's been in the last two decades. I would suggest that that investors and financial advisors think in terms of not having all of their bond allocation into the aggregate index. It probably makes sense to, to have less interest rate risk than the aggregate and be somewhat more on the conservative side in a low or moderate duration uh, portfolio as opposed to a market duration portfolio. So are you talking two to five year maturities, for instance? Yeah, exactly. E exactly. And actually the, 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 uh, the yield curve, uh, the coupon curve, uh, which is from two years on out, is inverted right now. But the two year is is higher than the the, the ten and the thirty year bonds. Yeah, right. and, and and that's an un, uh, an unusual configuration. And people look at it as a sign that recession's coming and the Fed's going to ease and all of that. And that's that that's a plausible scenario. Equally plausible scenario is that that portion of the yield curve is going to be maintained at or higher than it is right now by the higher for longer tactic that I think that the Fed should adopt, will adopt, which is the notion that interest rates that are under their control, which is the front end of the yield curve, should have uh, a, an association with where the real-time inflation rate is. And let's suppose that over the next six to 12 months that we, you know, are going to come down from, you know, the 8% zone to the 4 to 5% zone for inflation, which I would consider to be a success story, that would still leave us in the 4 to 5 zone. So the, the whole concept of a plateau that lasts for a while as inflation comes back down towards the 2% target makes a lot of sense to me. And also, and this may be a little bit provocative, I don't think the Fed really ever needs to get back to 2% because that, I think, is too close to zero. And effectively, it prohibits pricing power by labor, which has negative implications for income distribution in our country. The Fed will never say that it's not going to go back to two because it's got to say that for credibility reasons. But if if three years from now, we are, say, in the 3 to 4% range for inflation, I would consider that to be a good outcome, not a failure. Paul, you said that you your base case scenario is not a severe recession. What is your base case scenario? My base case scenario is for a soft-ish landing, which Meaning is... A gives you enough degrees of freedom to pretty much argue anything, I, I, I guess. Definitely the whole notion of two quarters of negative GDP is not the definition of a recession. Our economy was not in recession in the first half of this year. And so I think we could have what, this is a phrase we're old enough to remember people talk about growth recessions, which is that you're not, you know, blood and guts going down in your economy, you know, of, you know, people going bankrupt and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but that is a very 
punk growth rate that could be associated with modest uptrend in the unemployment rate, you know, from, from a three handle conceptually to a four handle to take some of the heat out of the, the labor market. So I'm looking at something that might fit the broad definition of a growth recession, but a self feeding recession that's a result of too much debt and unwinding of excesses, I really just don't see on the horizon. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have all of us own some of in a diversified portfolio? For investors on the bond side of their diversified portfolio, I would recommend having shorter durations than the marketplace, meaning rather than having a bond index fund that would be, you know, seven to 10 years that I would come into like the three to five area, the average duration or maturity of the portfolio, meaning that they have less risk of having the nasty they had in the first half of this year, if they were way out the curve. So I would come in from the, the, the seven to 10 zone to the three to five. Paul McCulley, always a treat to have you on Wealth Track, financial thought leader, influential Fed watcher. Thanks for your insights and your advice. My pleasure, Consuela. Thank you. For previous interviews with Paul McCulley, go to wealthtrack.com. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. In the meantime, make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.